Hello, good morning, everybody. Afternoon or evening, like I say, because I don't know what time you're watching this, but the Lord richly bless you. <clears throat> this is Pastor Cliff with the Grace Hour. It's a pleasure and a blessing to be with you. And um, just to get, want to remind you again that most things are going down on the bottom there, but I just want to remind you again that telephone number is a WhatsApp number. So therefore, you want my WhatsApp number, there it is if you're watching. Uh, please go on our website, pastorcliff.org, which is going across the bottom as well, and join Pastor Evangelist Cliff Chapman Ministries on Facebook. And the email address is there, cliffchapman521 at yahoo.com. So the Lord bless you, and they're all the contacts for me. And um, we just thank you again for viewing today. If you're there, let us know that you're there, because it's a big blessing to me. And today's subject is Grace Sets Free. It's the last of a series I've been doing over the last three weeks about not under law, but under grace. And today I just want to talk about the subject that excites me most, which is grace sex free. Before I get round to that, I um, was uh, just thinking and the Lord inspired me and just nudged me to share a little bit of verses from Psalm 91, because there might be people watching today that need to know and be encouraged the fact that the Lord is your shield, he's your, bunk, bunk, he's your buckler, which is a strong tower, a person that surrounds you and helps you. So I just wanted to read a little bit of Psalm 91, not all of it. Some of you will be pleased to know, but there again, if I read it all, I might get into preaching about it. So, um, But Psalm 91 is a wonderful psalm, and uh, I just think that you need to read it, learn it, let the word of God become alive in you and let the spirit of God quicken these words to you today because that's what he wants. The word of God with knowledge in your head will not change your life, but the word of God in the spirit will. Hallelujah. So I'm going to read um, Psalm 91, the verse that I'll put on my heart to encourage some people today before we go into our main subject. And if this is for you, then you can let me know and uh, it'd be nice to, to know that this blessed you and helped you. Um, and like I say, if you are there today, do let me know, because I, I really enjoy that when people just put up there and they're, they're watching. It's great. Psalm 91, verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the mighty, Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the stare of the fowler and from the noise and, noise and pestilence. He shall cover me with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be my shield, be my shield and buckler. I just want to encourage to, to, today that God is saying to you that you're dwelling in God, you're dwelling in a secret place of the Almighty. He takes care of you, he's with you, right? And he, he's round about you, he's the most high that has a shadow around about me and you looking after us, amen? And, you know, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. God's feathers, as it were, like the eagle puts, uh, Mother Eagle puts her feathers around the little eaglets, and God protects them, and God protects you today. He looks after you today. He's with you today. He's round about you today. You abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Hallelujah. Think of heavens looking after you today. Heavens all around about you today. Hallelujah. Wonderful to know that, isn't it? And it, <clears throat> then in this verse two, it says this. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge, my fortress, my God in him will I trust. I will say of the Lord. The Lord wants you to speak it out today. You might feel like you're all sorts of things coming against you. You might feel like you're on your own. You might feel like you're being laughed, neglected, whatever. Jesus will never let ne ne you. Jesus will never let you down. God will never fail you. Hallelujah. And no matter what you're going through today, it's there to enlarge you and to help you and bring you on. But God wants us to say, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. I will say today, Lord, I thank you that you're my refuge. I thank you, Lord, that you're my fortress. I thank you, Lord, that you're my strong tower. I will say, I will say. It implies that you've got to make the effort to say it. So we can either speak out the negative or we can speak out the positive. I will say that God is prospering me. I will say that God is meeting my needs. I will say, God, you're my refuge. 
I will say today, God, you're my fortress in the storm. I will say today, Lord, I'm on the rock. And Lord, the storms rage and things come around. I'm not going to be defeated because, Lord, you're with me and you're strong. And you're a strong tower with me. You're my rock. You're my fortress. I will say, the Lord, he's my refuge, my fortress. Fortresses were normally built on a hill and you could see what people were coming. It was very hard to... to um, overcome that that castle and that fortress because it was so well built and it was in a position where it could see the enemy coming and defeat the enemy. So today you live in heavenly places where God will protect you and look after you in a fortress in the Lord. With Jesus in your boat, you're not going to sink. And finally from this psalm, before I get into the subject, it says this, <clears throat> verse 11, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. I just want to say again, I thank the Lord for his protection of the road. Um, here in England, um, I don't know what it is, but people have got more mad on the road. They, they, they charge around a lot more and and um, people are very, very busy and, and, and people tend to do things on the road that are a little bit strange. Uh, we, we find that in St. Jude's of where you see they pull out and they don't look and all sorts of things. So you've got to be alert on the road. And even as us, sometimes we just have a moment to relapse or... <gasps> For a second, and God protects us, and all of a sudden you feel like, how did I break there? How did I get through? How did that happen? How did I, you protect me in that, Lord? Someone overtakes you in a rush, like happened to me on the way to football the other week. Scared the life out of me, to be truthful. The driving that fast. Made me, made me go, <gasps> oh, you ever had that? But anyway, what I'm trying to say is this, that God put his char angels in charge around about you. There's angels protecting you in your ways. And I want to encourage you in that, that there's angels protecting you in your ways today. The angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him. If you worship him and you honor him and you your lights before him, and you said, Lord, are you protect my ways and you guard me, Lord, then God will look after you. June and I pray every time we get in the car, Lord, protect us on this journey. But how short it is, we ask the Lord to do it. And he does look after us and he's got. I've just seen it happen time and time again. So God looks after you in your ways, whether you're walking down the street, crossing the road, driving a car, whatever you're doing is with you. So today, God, your force receives your deliver. So there's a little short sermon on that to encourage you and to help you and to build you up. And I, if that's helped you, blessed you, um, encouraged you today, then let me know on Pastor Evans' Cliff Chapman Ministries on Facebook or email me cliffchapman521 at yahoo.com or just um, ring me or WhatsApp me and let me know. And uh, it's encouraged you, right? Because that number's gone across the bottom there. Amen. Now, to get back to the subject we were talking about in the last two weeks, and this is the final week I'm going to share on this. I will share more in the, as the future in the future. But today, I just wanted to round things off. As that's the right way to say it. I wanted to bring things together and let people see where we live and finish on the positive side of this subject. If you remember from the last few weeks, and just to people might be viewing for the first time today, so to help them understand what we're talking about, we're talking about the law, which was given to Moses. You'll find that, that the people wanted that to happen in Exodus chapter 19. You'll find that the, the, the law was given in Exodus 20. You'll find the story of, of Moses writing on the tablets in Exodus 32 and 33. And you'll find the fact that when uh, Moses came down the first time, they built the golden calf. The people thought they could do it in their own strength, like Exodus 19 verse 8 teaches. We can do it. We can keep all your things. We're full of pride, full of self-righteousness, and thought they could do what God told them to do. And that, hence they say, well, you bring a law, and we'll, we'll keep it all, we'll do it all. Which, you can, and in your own strength, you can. And that's what the law was. It was a set of rules. If you do it, you'll get blessed. If you don't do it, then you'll you'll get the curses. The clearest example and the easiest way to find all them together, or a lot of them together, is Deuteronomy chapter 28. It lists the blessings and it lists the curses. There's a lot more curses than there is blessings in that chapter. But uh, basically, you, you can... You can look at that chapter and it sums a lot of things up. And uh, then the situation is that, 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 that the law came in because man wanted it. He thought he could do it in his own strength, which is basically summing up in one word, pride. 
and and that's the problem today with the world the world today um rulers that, that are necessary of course we need rulers in countries of course we need people to do things like that of course we do but the thing is um what i'm trying to say is this that they thought they could do it and they couldn't and hence the law came into being and that's what we've been teaching over the last few weeks the law came into being it's the law of sin and death in other words if we did <clears throat> what was right you could get blessed tremendously if you didn't um you could some of the occasions it would mean that you would um be be killed or, or um that was a punishment it was, it was really really harsh but the, but but all these laws came in and the laws of them are listed in leviticus and um you can read all these laws and dividends that came in and um, but that was the law of moses that was the law that came under, under moses and um that's because of all the things they couldn't keep the law when he came down and he saw the golden calf in it and uh, Moses got angry and he broke the tables of stone and that day 3,000 people died. So it's, 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 it's sad, it's sad, but they, they couldn't keep it and they're running around naked and they got a golden calf and they, oh, it, they just, in you know, man's own strength, they, they completely couldn't do it. So that was the law and then they brought in the Day of Atonement where the priest went once a year into the Holy of Holies, right through into the through the veil into the Holy of Holies, and there he he gave uh, and a sacrifice. The sacrifice was given for the cover of the sins for the people for that year, and it was for a year with a covering. Right, it was a Day of Atonement, but it was a covering. It wasn't couldn't fully wash out sin. When you can one that can wash out sin fully is the Lord Jesus Christ, and when He came and He died on the cross, that's what He did. So that was the law. The law was brought into being. So it's a case of what you do is what you, you you'll be blessed. If you don't do, you won't be blessed, and you're constantly, you'll suffer whatever consequences of not doing what was right. So that was the law. The case of doing or not doing. That's that was the law, and it was it was written on stones. It was there. People had to keep it, and the, the like I say, the covering was, the, and they got the sins covered once a year. By the priest going into holy of holies, you'll find that in Numbers chapter fifteen and verse twenty-five. But um, <clears throat> that's that's where it is, and and there's just one verse related to it. There's a lot of teaching in the area. There's a lot of things that can be taught on the area. But what I just want to share for a few minutes today is that yes, that was there, and it had to be done away with. And Hebrews nine talks about, and eight talks about the fact that. You know, the old covenant, the old covenant could not fulfill that, that God wanted. It couldn't fulfill it. And like I shared the other week, Hebrews chapter 8, you'll find that the Lord had to bring on a new covenant. He had to do because the old covenant couldn't fulfill what God wanted to fulfill. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 1, then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and worldly sanctuaries. And there's a tabernacle in the midst, et cetera, et cetera. And he brought about all this tabernacle and the Holy of Holies and where they were in and all the sacrifices. You read that in Hebrews 9. And then in verse in Hebrews 8, right, um, it, it, it says in Hebrews 8 and verse 7, for if, for if that first covenant had been faultless, there should be no place been sought for a second. Right, so the... Keeping the law and doing all them things was the was faultless. In other words, you, that was going to bring you to right standing with God. It, he, the writer of Hebrews quite clearly states that's not the case because the first covenant was not fault, right? So there had to be a second covenant. And verse 8 says this. For finding fault with them, he said, For all the days come, saith the Lord, will I make a new covenant, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Right, not according to the covenant that I made in their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand of lead them out of Egypt, and because they continued not in my covenant, I would regard them not, saith the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with them, the house of Israel, after those days, so that I will put my laws into their mind, write them in their hearts, and will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. 
Right, so basically, this is summing up, you'll find that in the Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16 as well, about the new covenant. It's basically saying God had to bring a new covenant. I've got so much I can share on this because it's, it's an, an issue that, uh, not an issue, it's a, a, a passion of my heart about teaching the fact that we don't live in two covenants today. Teaching the fact that we we want to get away from the fact that we live in one, we live in two covenants today. Romans chapter 8 verse 2 teaches, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath, past tense, set me free from the law of sin and death. And the law of sin and death is the law that I've just spoken about, which is Moses. So today you're in grace, you've been set free. I pray, Lord Jesus, share these words. That it'll help people today to see they live in one covenant, Lord. They live in the covenant of the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I said it last week and I say it again. It doesn't mean to say that grace and walking in grace allows you to live an ungodly life. Far from it. It causes you to live a, a closer life to the Lord, really, because you know you're loved by him. You know you're securing him. You know you can walk by the, the fact that that you are free in him and that you can have that relationship with him and you want to please him from a heart of love. That's why the right in Hebrews says, I write my laws in the minds and the hearts. In other words, God will write it to the point that you, on your heart and in your mind, and, and you want to believe and follow God from the heart, from what is relationship to, to please God from the heart. For those that are married, and um, you know, I've been married for quite a few years now, like a long time, really. And um, you know, at one point, I tried to change Judith into some ways that that I wanted her to be, and she wanted to try and change me into some ways I wanted to be. But it didn't work because when you're trying to keep trying to change someone and and, and uh, want them to be what you want them to be, it doesn't work. But when you love love on someone and you pray. And say, Lord, just like to pray, Lord, just help you to change in that way. She changed by not by me nagging or trying to get her to change. She changed by the love that was um, given to her, and vice versa. Love causes change. Trying to tell people to do what's right, they usually fail. They usually fall, do the opposite. If you bring out children, you'll you'll find that when they <clears throat> you tell them not to do something, they they most likely will do it. They, you'll, you know, you, you, they just do that. That you don't don't have that cake before you have a new evening. Don't have don't, don't eat that chocolate before you have an evening meal. The child probably does goes towards that chocolate, probably eats it and and disobeys you because it's just the way it is. Because you're trying to tell them not to do it. I'm not saying don't discipline children. I'm not saying that, but you'll find that a lot of times. When you tell someone to do to do something, do not do it, they do it. Hence, they, because they're trying to do it in their own strength. When you're telling someone to <clears throat> do it in their own strength and not lean upon the Lord in it, they will more, more often not fail. What I'm saying today is this, that we've got a covenant that causes us to live in an attitude of love. I don't want to do things that will hurt Judah. I think she doesn't want to do things that will hurt me because it's a love relationship. And it's the same with the Lord. You, you get a relationship with the Lord where his laws upon your, are written upon your heart and in your mind. It's a spiritual, spirit relationship with him. And therefore, you want to obey God from the heart. And you want to live a life that please, lives worthy and pleasing unto the Lord like Ephesians 3 talks. Paul writes, he says, let your walk be worthy of your calling. Paul also was, doesn't he, in, in, in the book of Corinthians. Don't let, don't let your grace, the grace you've got, become uh, an area where because you've got grace in your life, where you become frivolous, you become ungodly, you become like the children of Israel. They, they, they got golden calves running around naked, having a party, whatever. God doesn't want that. He wants you to have a relationship where you live holy and pleasing towards God. But it comes from the heart. It comes from a love relationship. <clears throat> in the new covenant, Walk well, with the Lord, I fully believe it's a relationship thing. It's a love love relationship with the Lord. A realisation where you realise his other father, he cares for you. 100% he cares for you. 
And therefore, you want to obey him from the heart. You want to do that right from the heart. And relationship in him, you want to please your Heavenly Father because you know how much you love. And that's the key, right? That is the difference. Law shows a God which at that time is true. I mean, at that time, there was a, you know, it's like a, as I saw, a big stick. When you did something wrong, you, you, you suffered the consequences and you were hit over the head. Previously speaking, with the head, the consequences were there. Jesus today, when you do something wrong, uh, you, you, you say, Lord, I'm sorry, and you walk on, and you say, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that I can walk on in you. That's different. It's a relationship thing. God's not got a big stick out. You live in a new covenant today where God loves you as a child. He will correct you. He will change you. He'll cause you to grow in him day by day. He'll point out things that are wrong, but he points out in love. Because if you're a son of God, you're going to be chastened by the Lord. You're going to be corrected by the Lord. You're going to be moved on in God, but it's a love thing. It's a relationship thing. Lord, I want to be better. Lord, I really want to live this life. And you realize that you only overcome because of his life inside of you. You can only love people that are unlovely by the grace of God, by the spirit of God. In you. The spirit of God is shed abroad in your heart. And the spirit inside of you wants to love that person with God for what they've done. God gives you the ability to pray for them that despitefully use you and forgive them and move on. It's a, it's a relationship with heart relationship with God. A touching heart to heart, a oneness with him. Jesus lived in this position where he heard his father, did what his father did and wanted to please his father. I think it's John 5, 19. He wanted just, just the will of the Lord, just exactly what God wanted to do. That's how, and as he was in this world, so are we. God wants us to be the same thing, relationship with him, relationship with the Father, and pleasing him and doing what pleases him. Amen. And it says here in, in John 1, verse 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. For the law was given by Moses, which it was, which I shared them verses before. Exodus 19 and 20, Exodus 32 and 33. You'll find that it was given there, the law was given by Moses and grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Amen. And the law was something that, you know, it, it passed judgment. It wanted to just carry out, it, it, it was a judgmental thing. It, it was a case of like, if you did it right, like I said before, you were blessed if you didn't, then you, you suffered what was the curse. But God today wants us to realize today we've been redeemed from that. That more of Moses that was there, Jesus dealt with and broke it away. In Matthew chapter 27, verse 37, the veil was went in twain. When Jesus died on the cross, he did away with that old covenant. In Matthew chapter 5, and verse 17, he came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, he fulfilled it, he brought in grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Truth, in, he brought in truth, he brought a new way, a new and living way, like Hebrews 10, 16 brought. So it says, he brought a new and living way whereby you can walk in relationship with him. Your laws are written on your heart and in your mind. You read the spirit, the God's word by the spirit, and you therefore know that you can live a life that's therefore no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. I just want to look at a story here brief, briefly today. And how, if you're living in the law, you can judge people. You can become self-righteous if you don't watch it. <coughs> Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged. God wants us to be discerning, and that's a different thing. Discern after the spirit of God and hear what where someone's coming from, not by just the, the face or what they're saying to you outwardly. We discern where they're coming from. You 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 can like Jesus could read the intents of the heart. When when he really put the man down through the roof, they came to him, and Jesus could, could read what they were thinking in that room at that time. If you read that story, Jesus said that and you knew what they were thinking, and they said, This man has sins be forgiven, and the Pharisees were livid. 
they were so annoyed because he's got power to forgive sins. But Jesus discerned what they were thinking. And Isaiah talks about that, about Jesus. I think it's Isaiah 11, 1. God, that God didn't look after his, Jesus didn't look after his eyes. He looked after his spirit. So discerning is true, but judging is another thing. Someone's walking God and where they're in God, it's not for us to judge. They, they, where they're... Where they're walking, they're, everybody has an individual walk in the Lord. And everybody has an individual calling in the Lord. And we've got to bless our, our brother and sister for their calling where they are. We're not there to call, to judge people in, the, in that sense. We're there to discern. If they're doing things that is not correct in the Lord and we don't witness what they're saying and what their ministry is or what, you know, with a life behind the words, that's fine. Because the Lord gives us them positions to do that, says, you should know them by the fruits. So there's a balance in it. But what I'm trying to say is this, that God doesn't want us to judge, you know, because he's, well, I don't think that's, no, God wants us to, to be discerning and loving and supportive as much as possible. Oh, there's so much I can say on that. There's so much, I, I, today I'm, I'm putting so much together and saying so much and, and that, <laughs> I trust that you're getting helped, and I know you're getting helped. But you see, God wants us to know today that we are people of the Spirit. There's many led by the Spirit. There's many are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. It's a Spirit-led walk today. It's not a case of rules and regulations. It's a walk in the Spirit and a relationship with the Lord that keep causes you to walk holy before Him because He's made you holy. You're holy in the Lord. You're not coming trying to get holy. You, as far as God says, he sees you, he sees you holy. He's, he's bringing you more into that walk of holiness with him. He's, you're already, as God says, be holy as I am holy. God wants you to walk in holiness. Of course he does. But he wants you to walk in relationship with him. And grace sets you free to walk in that holiness where you want to please him. You don't want to look at things that, that are wrong. Do you get tempted in there? Of course you do. Everybody does. Even myself. You all get, I get tempted. But the Lord wants to say, Lord, is it worth it? Is it worth hurting your heart? Is it worth falling? You know, what are the consequences of that thing that I would do? What would it do to you? How much would it hurt you, Lord, by doing that? So you don't do it because you don't want to hurt the Lord. It's a relationship war, grace, grace is. It's a relationship war. That's what it is. And therefore, you, you sit back and you think, mm, oh, dear. See, because, see, the, the strength of sin is the law. So when you're trying to keep what you're trying to keep in your own strength, then you'll fall. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57 teaches that. But thanks be to God, which gives us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When you're trying to do it, when you're trying to keep things, you'll fall. Paul writes in Romans chapter 7, doesn't he? And he, he talks about, and it, and it's sandwiched between 6, 6, 7, and 8 that go together. <clears throat> because he's talking about when you try and do your own strength, you'll fall. Oh, the thing I'd like to do and I can't do, and what I couldn't do, or, you know, I, I want to do and I can't do. And I've gone through that, trying to be, please God in my own strength and trying to, well, I'll keep, I'll keep holy. I won't do that. I won't watch this. I shouldn't watch. I wouldn't, I wasn't say that about a person. I wasn't getting, and I've tried. You know what happened? I fell flat on my own face because that's the nature of me trying. God's showing you that you can't do it in your own strength. You have to lean upon him 100%. And the life that's inside you, you live by the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ inside you. That's a new covenant. Grace sets you free to be that. Romans chapter 5 and 17. By one man's offence, death reigned. In other words, sin came into the world through Adam, but Jesus became the second Adam. He did away with all that first Adam. He became the second Adam. He lived on this earth. He overcame on this earth to give you power to overcome. And like Romans 7, 5, 17 teaches, but by one man's death, resurrection power, Jesus died and be. <coughs> And he gave you power to live a victorious life. He gave you abundance of grace. Like it says in that first, the abundance of grace to overcome all situations. Hallelujah. You reign by leaning on his life. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If you're there, let me know you're there. It's lovely to be increased that way. But anyway, 
I wanted to just look briefly at something here and and I, I studied this myself and I've seen this myself and, and I I pray that it'll bless you today. I was looking at Roman well, I know it'll bless you today because the word of God in it sets you free. But Rome John chapter eight, it's the Pharisees and we're talking about the law and what how the law demands, but how grace sets free. You'll find this story in uh, John chapter eight. And um, Jesus is near the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. He's teaching the word and he was busy helping people grow in the word of God, which is wonderful to do and a blessing to do. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taking adultery in this and they set her in the midst. Can you wonder what this woman would have felt like? I, I don't. <coughs> <coughs> I might be wrong, excuse me, copy. But I don't think she had many clothes on. He just grabbed her and brought her there and sat this poor woman in the midst. And, and they say to him, Master, this was taking adultery in the very act. And Moses in the law commanded us that we that we should be that she should be stoned. But say but what sayest thou? The law is harsh. The law in the times of Moses and what have you, that, that keeping the covenant was tough, it was harsh. But the thing was, they were using the law, what they knew, what was written down in Leviticus, and they were bringing this to Jesus, and they were using the law, because the Pharisees were full of religious ways. They were full of do's and don'ts, they were religious people. Jesus said that about them. He said, you, you know, you've got all the outwards. You know all the scriptures you say all that, but woe, woe unto you, Pharisees and scribes, because you say it all outwardly, but your heart is far from me. So you can have all the outward, but still be, you know, not very gracious, not very loving. You can have all the knowledge you want, but it's a heart. And that's the new covenant to say it's a heart relationship. Glory to God. Anyway, they bring this poor woman and they put her in front of Jesus. They did this to accuse him. They did this to get him in a position where what's he going to do? Hallelujah. Put him in a position, what are you going to do? But God, the Lord, oh Lord, a relationship with his father. He was prepared. The spirit of God prepares you for to have the wisdom what to do and how to answer. And Moses, <clears throat> they were right in what they were saying. They weren't wrong. It was there. The ticket was written. They weren't, they weren't wrong at all. They were caught in what was correct in the law. And they said, tempting that he might, that they might accuse him. But Jesus stooped down. He stooped down. And when he stooped down, you know, Moses, this what I look at this. The way I look at this is that Moses brought the table, table of the stones twice. Once he broke them because he was so angry. And then he had to re bring him again, rewritten, right, a second time. Exodus 32, 33, right? But anyway, he writes down his stoops on the ground, right? And so they continue to ask him, can you, and they were asking him in a nice way. I, I believe they were really aggressive. I believe they were shouting and they weren't very pleasant at all. Go on, tell us what you're going to do. Go on. And like a bit of a mob. And Jesus went, he writes, writes on the, he goes down and he writes on the ground. And that's what Moses did with the tables. He threw them, wrecked them in, in, in anger and threw them down on, on the tables of stone, down in anger when he saw the cows. Like, <clears throat> but Jesus wrote on the ground. I believe it's like, as it were, he was saying that's like Moses. He, he brought these tablets and wrote them down to. He, he, he starts to go down the ground and stoops at once. That's when Moses bringing in once on that law that got all broken. And he continued to ask him, and then he got the word of wisdom, didn't he? And Jesus answered the, my Bible. Hi, Bate. Thank you very much for tuning in. Real encouragement. Bless you. He gets the word of the Lord. And Brother Godric, wonderful to have you there. Wonderful to have you watching. Thank you. And he, he writes down, doesn't he? He writes down on, on the on 
he's on the floor and he's just he's just just on the ground, stoop down on the ground. And he comes back with a word of wisdom. God will give you a word of wisdom in a situation. Hallelujah. He'll give you the right word and the right answer when people accuse you. He'll give you the right thing to say. Hallelujah. And Jesus had the right thing to say here. And he gets up and he says unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Because they, they, in the law, they had it right. She would be stoned and die. Jesus said then, had the word of wisdom to silence the crowd. God has the word to give you to silence the crowd. Amen. God has the word to give you to set people free. God has the word to give you at that, right, at that time to, to help people and deliver people. And Jesus said, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. And he goes down his scoops to start stooping again. And they all felt a guilt trip in the right way, convicted. Because what Jesus said was right. And, and they that heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, he had the right word that showed their motive was wrong, showed them that they were completely out of order that their motive was wrong they were angry they were judging god doesn't want us to judge people they were they were they were religiously angry and they were content to see a woman die they no grace in the heart at all grace gives you love for people and overcomes with people Grace gives you the ability to see past faults and see the favour. <clears throat> I've learned that, you know, it's very easy to see faults in people. Very easy. Even for me, anyone. But what God wants us to do is look beyond the faults, love them for who they are, and love will bring them on. People already know where they're, where they're, where they're sinning. They already know where they're wrong. They already know that if they've got a problem with drink, they already know they've got a problem with drink. You don't need to point that out. You need to be a solution bringer. Let the love of God be there. People already know that when they, <clears throat> they, they're they saying and they're coming to you about their brother and sister and they're telling stories that they're wrong. So you don't want to listen. Say, Lord, I don't want to, I don't, brother, sister, I don't want to listen to that. Brother and sister, if you've got a problem with someone, like the Bible says, go and talk to them. Don't come to me about them. All right? Go and see them first. God, you already know that they already know they're wrong. Love them to say, well, don't, brother, just a little sister, I love you, but go and talk to your brother and sister first. Oh, well, I just wanted to tell you because I felt the Lord, you could pray about them. Well, if you really want me to pray about them, fine, but don't don't come tell me all about their life. I don't want to know anymore. Amen. Is that not true? So God wants us to, but Jesus silenced all these people. His words brought up to them. Right, convicted them, they knew they were wrong. And Jesus then said to them, that, <clears throat> What he said to them, they decided to leave, they decided to go one by one from the eldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus was, remember, he was still stooped down. That one was probably standing there, maybe um, wondering what's going to happen, probably fearful of her own life. She could have been shaking for all I know. And Jesus was left there with her. And Jesus lifted up, because like to me, then the second time the, the, the tablets of stone were brought and they were laid down. Jesus stooped down for the second time. He was, in a sense, he was, he, to me, it's like a, a beginning of showing that grace is the key. And Jesus was lifted up, lifted up himself and saw nothing, none but the woman. And he said unto her, woman, where are those that line accuse you? Hath no man condemned thee? In other words, he was bringing into being what we're in today. The law of the spirit of life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who's there to condemn you? And Jesus said, and she said, no man, Lord. And she said to her, Neither do, do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. 
Then he goes on to say this. And Jesus spake unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of the world. Jesus didn't condemn her. He knew what she'd done wrong. He knew she wasn't done something that was not right. Of course, he didn't condemn her to go and sin no more. He didn't say that she hadn't sinned. He said, "Those who accuse, have this, a man accuser have no man condemned thee." She said, "Now do I, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin." No more. So he knew what she'd done was wrong. He knew that she'd sinned, but he didn't condemn her. Grace sets you free. There's therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah today. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ. Jesus was putting forth a new way of walking. Go and sin no more. I believe personally. It's my, that's my interpretation of the scripture. When he went down twice, he was showing the law of God. He had gone out of the way. The Moses, the Moses attitude from the Pharisees that had gone. I'm bringing a new covenant today, a covenant of grace. I'm bringing it into something where there's no condemnation. I don't condemn you. God doesn't condone sin, <clears throat> but he doesn't condemn you. He knows you'll fail now and again. He knows I might have a wrong thought now and again, but it loves me for who I am. I'm right, it's not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done. Amen. If God points out, I've got to say, Lord, I'm sorry for that thing, or I say it was wrong, or my attitude's wrong, God will show me. And I'm quite willing to say, Lord, I've got that wrong, or I'm thinking about that brother and sister wrong. Or whatever. I'm quite willing to change. But he doesn't condemn me. Hallelujah. He changes me out of a heart of love. Can you understand what I'm saying? It's not a, a rule. This is it, what it is, and this is what you should do. The Pharisees and the religious leaders that day had come to, to the letter of the law for that, that woman, that individual woman. But Jesus changed the whole atmosphere. <clears throat> and his words set it, uh, uh, an into being conviction, and they changed. Why? Because God, by the grace of God and by the wisdom of God, showed them how how that attitude and the, the, the what was completely wrong. God's, God will and the Lord will show us when we're, when we're doing things that aren't quite correct before him, but we don't get condemned. We say, Lord, all right, I made a mistake, but Lord, make, change me more in that area. God speaks to you about the areas you've got to change in where you, where you need to grow in him, but it's out of a drawing and a wooing to be more like him to change and become more like him. And it's a grace thing. It's like a kind of stressing of a it. It's a heart thing. It's not a do and a don't. Hallelujah. Amen. If you read Romans 7 and all the problems he had there and all the things he goes through and he talks about a struggle against sin, because that's what the whole chapter's about. It's like a light bulb goes on. The he couldn't serve the Lord in his own strength. And in what he tried to do, he found it. And then in verse 8, verse chapter 8, verse 1, a light bulb goes on there. There's therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, right? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In other words, a spiritual walk, a walk of the heart with God. He realized there was no therefore, no condemnation, no guilt. Lord, because you paid it all. Amen. Because you brought it forth and you brought it, brought us to live in that victory. I want to tell you today, grace sets free. As Jesus says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Free indeed to enjoy a relationship with the Lord, not to do your own thing, but to do the will of God and to honor him as much as possible from your heart. But God doesn't condemn you. We all make mistakes. We all do things that aren't right. We all do things that we've run ahead of God, all sorts of things I could go on today about. But, you know, God bringing you back into the centre of his will if you if your heart's towards him. Instead of our day when he was the greatest king, why not? Because he did everything right, but because he had a heart towards God. Today's relationship with the Lord is one of walking in the spirit and a heart relationship. I just want to <clears throat> look at, 
one of the things I studied quite a bit was Galatians. In closing today, I just want to share these verses. You know, that, that God wants us to realize that we're justified by the life of the Lord and by the blood of Jesus Christ, not by our own works. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we, we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by faith of God and not by the works of the law. For the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. In other words, trying to keep right before God in your own strength, in your own ability, in the law. Trying to get saved by the, you do more good things than bad things. That's not the case. It's nothing to do with your works. By grace you're saved through faith alone, not your own works, but by God. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. It's not by works, it's by the law, but it's by God's spirit. Paul is writing, and I'm going to try to close here. I've got so much more I could say, but <clears throat> Galatians is a book which Paul is quietly is, is teaching the difference between walking in the spirit and walking in the spirit of grace and the spirit of, of what God's got today and not going back to the law and trying to do it in your own strength. And that's where he fell out and had a row with Peter about. Because Peter was trying to bring back some things from the... <clears throat> oh, excuse me, from the law, from the old covenant and bring it into the new, and that's not the case. And that's where people go wrong today. You've been set free from the law of sin and death, and you live in the law of spirit of life in Christ, and you've been set free from one you brought from I take it out of one covenant into a new covenant today. Hebrews 10 16, amen. And also there, I think it's Hebrews 8 22. But you've got that that position today. And he says these words, and I want to say this to you today, and it's true. They're strong words, but they're true. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not, should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has both evidently set you forth, crucified among you. Then, this only do what I learn of you. Receive ye by the Spirit, Spirit, by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having been good in the spirit, that you now may be perfect in the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it not be, be yet in vain? He therefore that minister to you in the spirit, working miracles among you, do it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Even as Abraham believed God, it was accounted him for righteousness. What he's basically saying is, you can't live the Christian life in trying to do in your own strength. You cannot do it by keeping the law like the children of Israel tried to do. You can't do it. You've got to live in a spiritual walk in the spirit with him. You got saved by the spirit of God, not by any works you've done. You're saved by the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ today. And Paul was clearly teaching this church. You've got, you've got to see what he, the whole book is about. They were trying to go back to, the, you have to do some things in the law, like circumcision, et cetera, et cetera, go back to the man. And, Paul was annoyed with this church because he was saying, you've begun in the spirit with the acts of doing this, that, and the other in the, in the law sense. It's the flesh. It's you trying to prove God. It's you trying to think you've got to do that to earn, continue to earn your salvation. And God was, he was saying, no, it's by the spirit of God. God saved you in the spirit. You walk in the spirit. And you do things after the spirit. And you're foolish to try and do it any other way. Foolish is what Paul said. Foolish. I'm going to close on that. But the thing is, what I'm saying is this, that God wants you to realize that in your own strength, you can't do it and you're foolish to try. Lean upon his life. Realize where you are today. You live in the Lord's spirit of life in Christ. He has set you free from the Lord's sin of death. You walk in the liberty and the freedom and relationship with the Lord. Amen. Today. And you walk in that position today where you got free in him and you can walk in relationship with him. You walk a holy life in him and you will become in his life today. Amen. Don't be foolish. Don't try and bring the two covenants together. Live and just live in the one in Jesus name today. Amen. I know I've spoken a long time today, but the Lord richly bless you. And uh, if you've got any more questions, then contact me on Pastor Evangelist Cliff Chapman Ministries or email me. 
and today I pray that you'll live just in that one new covenant today that God brought in. He did away with it all. The veil was written, rent in twain, and you live in the law of spirit of life in Christ Jesus today. Amen. So today, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, then pray this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you today. I confess my sins to you today. I make you Lord and Savior today. And I ask you to come into my heart and save me. And I thank you for doing it. Amen. If you're ill in any way, we're going to pray right now. Lord, will touch you. Lord, I pray you'll touch anybody who's watching this program today. It's sick today. I thank you on the new covenant by your strikes and heal. And I pray, Lord, that you'll build feel your power today, touching them by the Spirit. Amen and amen. And today, again, I want to just thank you for all your support. Thank you for watching. Allah richly bless you. And we'll um, talk to you again soon. Um, so the Lord richly bless you. Thank you very much for viewing. And if you've got any questions, please contact me. Either email me or phone me or um, send me a message on Pastor Evangelist Cliff Chapman Ministries. The Lord richly bless you. Martin, I'm going. I've taught a long time today, but it's a passion in my heart. So you can now close if you wish to, my dear brother. God bless you. Amen and amen. Are you there? Bless you all. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, the Lord richly bless you. Remember, look at our pay, our website, pastorcliff.org. Pastorcliff.org. Tell people about it. We've now got on there um, digital books. You can get a digital book on there now, which is uh, something we're starting to do. So that's even that's another great thing we've added. So the Lord bless you. And remember, Jesus loves you. Walk in the spirit of the Lord, spirit of life in Christ Jesus which has set you free from the law of sin and death. God bless you, Pastor Cliff. Bye.